The choir has a long history of commissioning works, right back to the first musical director, Stephen Schaefer, who is a huge supporter of Australian music. I'm not sure what the choir's first commission was, but certainly over the choir's history, we've commissioned works from Gordon Carey, from Eleanor Katz Chernan, uh, from Matthew Heinsohn, Carl Vine, uh, Nigel Butterley, uh, and I'm probably missing some other people as well, but they were certainly a number of our major commissions, and it's really nice to be bringing John Peterson into the fold. I've always considered myself a composer and um, I teach at the University of New South Wales. I uh, teach composition there as well as other music subjects. I remember writing little piano pieces when I was about 14 uh, but I never really thought anything of it and uh, I just think it, I just thought everyone who played piano wrote their own music and um, it took me a long time to actually realise that a lot of people don't do that. Um, but I didn't really have a lot of guidance in that either, so it took me a long time to end up at university studying composition. So I was actually in my late 20s by the time I actually took composition seriously. But I had been probably writing since I was 14. Yeah. Commissioning is a very expensive process from the point of view of a community organisation. From the point of view of the composer doing all the work, it's probably not really... Uh, um, adequate re recompense for the hours of work that they put in to this. Uh, you think a composer may have been working on a piece for six months, maybe a year, uh, and ultimately, you know, they might sort of get $10,000 out of that. Uh, so it looks like a goodly chunk of money, and it feels like a goodly chunk of money for a community organisation to be paying out. Uh, but really, we get very good value for money um, working with the composers that we do. But it is always a very ambitious undertaking. So when you're composing, and are you always in front of the piano playing those notes, or is it a lot of just happening in the head, a bit like the, the deaf Beethoven in a sense, it's able to create it up there? Um, no, for me, um, composition is, is not about, um, not often about inspiration, it's about perspiration. <laughs> so, so I do sit at the piano most of the time, and I, I just play around, I improvise, and I, I find an area harmonically that I'm happy with and, um, and start writing melodies around that type of thing. Um, I might come up with again a good rhythmic idea um, that I think that would be interesting. Um, a lot of things drive um, the ideas but I'm almost always at the piano and then I might transfer it to uh, computer notation fairly quickly because I'm also a terrible writer and so I can hardly read my own sketches sometimes. So it's better if it's very neatly laid out and then I can um, start editing after I've got a nice copy of what I've, I think I've written. <laughs> We've talked about the, the composing in the sense of the music itself probably at this stage. Um, the obvious question is, you know, um, which do you start with? The, in, in, in the case of a choral work, this particular work for us, um, is, it the, is, is it the words that come first or the, or the music? Oh, definitely the text because the, de the text drives everything and um, for me I actually spent quite a few months um, just finding the text and trying to shape the, what I thought the themes of the piece should be because it's such a big work, 50 minutes of music, um, so it had to have some overarching ideas that, that would um, amount to something after 50 minutes. There's nothing worse than getting to the end of a 50 minute piece and going, oh, is that all it is, you know. Um, so it had to start with some uh, text ideas that I thought would be of interest, not only to me but to everyone. Um, and so a lot of time was spent on not even thinking about music really, but just what text would um, form uh, the themes. Because once you have the themes, the music then can fit in with the themes, but without those, it's too hard. So definitely I spent a long, long time with text. And even when I thought I had the final version of the text, um, what actually you have now is actually, I would say, 50% uh, different to what I when I started writing the music, I thought I had the final version of the text, but when I finished the music, that had changed quite a lot. My favourite thing about this work is that with all the time that John spent choosing lyrics, the lyrics that were actually chosen first, really, uh, were the lyrics for the final movement. And they come from Michael Kirby's speech at the Gay Games. And when John first started talking about his love of using sort of what he calls found text. So not necessarily poems, but headlines, newspaper clippings, bits and pieces that you can somehow recontextualise and build a story out of. I thought, well, 
Mike was one of the choir patrons. He's been an incredibly important influence and supporter of us. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use some of his amazing rhetoric because he's such a good speaker? And so we got his speech with his permission and I sent it through to John and he said, this is amazing. You know, it almost reads like poetry. He had to make very few changes to actually be able to fit it to music. And that was the fifth movement. And we knew from very early on that that was going to be the fifth movement. I think it's always important to give lyrics context. And I think if you give the lyrics context, it also helps to give the music context. I know John went through a very lengthy process to select all of the lyrics, especially to try to find things um, that we could use freely. Uh, and Walt Whitman, for example, became a strong theme. You know, as a, as a homosexual man, uh, Walt Whitman's poetry seemed to be really apt and it obviously struck a chord with John and he keeps cropping up throughout this work. Uh, so what I chose to do this time for story time uh, was to find a bit of a history of Walt Whitman and to, to talk about his life and essentially his loves as well and his sexual exploits, which are is in some ways sort of the hidden side of Walt Whitman. You know, people talk about this great American literature, but they don't necessarily talk about what the man got up to when he wasn't writing his, uh, his great American literature. And I think it's important to understand the sexual subtext behind what Whitman's writing because it you know once you know what you're looking for it's quite explicit and I think it's important that you know what you're looking for so you know why it is that you're singing it. I have to say from a choir member's perspective on that first night opening up the prelude and starting to sing the surprise at who was responsible for the words. Yeah the the lyrics for the prelude really surprised me as well I know very little about Henry Lawson and I realized how little I knew when the prelude arrived because I know Henry Lawson from the loaded dog and all that you know typical Australiana uh, that's you know got that sort of fairly black sense of humor and yet here's this amazing metaphysical poem about a, a you know a man on his own journey and it's Henry Lawson and it's so apt for all of us on our own very individual journeys. It was a surprise to me, it was a surprise to a number of people in the choir, but it's particularly nice that we can start with an Australian poet. But you do have to look through um, Lawson a bit and to find these these gems if as they were, but I found that one and I just really loved it and I thought, wow, that's, you know, just, um, it's, it speaks to every generation, you know, since um, he wrote that. And it's, it's hard for me sometimes to, to look at a text like that, that he's written, and then compare it to his bush poetry, which is, is in a different category altogether. And I, I saw that's an incredibly mature piece of writing. So it, it, um, it really sort of sparked the whole um, dreams idea for the piece.